My name is Aaron McCullough. I am the librarian for English Language and Literature here at Hatcher Graduate Library. Um, some of you know me, some of you don't know me. Um, but today is the second day of our um, library celebration of National Poetry Month, April. And um, today we have four readers, um, all drawn from the University of Michigan writing community. Um, two from, well, I guess actually, yes, two from the MFA program, one from the residential college, and then one from uh, the Sweetland Center. Um, Ray, is that an accurate description of, of your position? <laughs> okay. Um, I, want, I have a few opening comments, um, and they're going to be kind of uh, loosey-goosey, because that's how uh, my comments often are. Um, try to keep them as spontaneous as possible. But um, I just wanted to reflect for a minute on um, this idea of National Poetry Month and um, why it's now. <laughs> um, and so, <clears throat> because this is something every year, I think, why is it that we, that we do this thing in April called National Poetry Month? Um, I, I'm sure there's a, actually a reason. I, I'm sure you could trace it to some specific decision made by someone. Um, and, uh, but I prefer to kind of speculate. Um, that's <laughs> when it comes to poetry, especially, I prefer to be speculative. And um, so my speculation is that uh, this has something to do with um, spring. That seems obvious enough. Um, and spring is this thing um, that I find, this, the season that I find most horrifying um, and sort of wonderful at the same time. And maybe other people feel that way too. T.S. Eliot, of course, famously said, um, April is the cruelest month. And um, what that means exactly is open to interpretation, surely. But um, he's also sort of, he's sort of checking um, or shouting out to um, Geoffrey Chaucer and the, the general prologue um, to the Canterbury Tales. Um, so I wanted to just read that, not in, I won't read it in Middle English. <laughs> I, I mean, I, I'd love to, but I won't um, make you endure that. Um, so I'll just read the sort of modernized um, first few lines. Many of you are going to be familiar with this, of course, but it's good to hear again. When April with his showers sweet with fruit, the drought of March has pierced unto the root, and bathed each vein with liquor that has power to generate therein and sire the flower. When Zephyr also has with his sweet breath quickened again in every holt and heath the tender shoots and buds, and the young sun into the ram one half his course has run, and many little birds make melody that sleep through all the night with open eye, so nature pricks them on to ramp and rage. Then do folk long to go on pilgrimage. Um, why do people start to go on pilgrimages in April? <laughs> um, it has something to do with rebirth, um, according to Chaucer, um, and water getting down to the roots and, and sort of springing the bulbs out. Um, and we also have these two big religious holidays, um, Passover, Easter, arguably the same holiday, you know, cast through different lenses or seen through different lenses. Um, <clears throat> both, it's these, these sort of terrifying holidays, right? These are, these are holidays that, that um, are remembrances of the Passover, of some horrible, scary thing. Um, and so you get both the terror and the sort of alleviation simultaneously. Um, so I just wanted to read one other thing that I associate um, with Easter um, or Passover, and it's a Donald Ravel poem um, for Thomas Traherne, and then I'll introduce our readers um, in turn. I'll do each one um, at, before they come up. So this poem's called For Thomas Traherne, and it, it gets at kind of most of the things that I didn't say so well just a minute ago. The ground is tender with cold rain. Far and equally, our coastlines grow younger with tides. Beautiful winter, not becoming spring today and not tomorrow, has time to stay. Easter will be very late this year. 
Thirty years ago, I saw my church all flowery and snow melting in the hair of the procession as tender as today. A sight above all festivals or praise is earth everywhere and all things here becoming younger, facing change in the dark weather now like winter, candling underground as rain. Okay, so Keith Taylor is gonna be our first reader. Um, Keith directs the UM undergrad creative writing program. Um, his recent publications include Marginalia for a Natural History, um, and also with Laura Kashishki, uh, Ghost Writers US, or sorry, <laughs> no, Us, um, Haunting Them. Um, and Laura's gonna read on Monday, so please come out for that. Um, I also wanna say that uh, Keith's books are for sale, as are all of our other authors in the back of the room. Um, we're also going to have a raffle, and you've probably dropped your name off for that, but um, we will be giving away one of one book by each of the authors um, at the end, so please stay for that, <laughs> if, if not for the poetry, pizza, t-shirts, etc., et and my emceeing. Okay, Keith, thank you for being here, and please come up to the microphone. One that April with her shoes suit to the drucht of March at person of Ruta, and bathed every vine in switch liqueur of which virtue engendered is the floor. I see, I don't mind being pretentious. Uh, uh, it may, may bother Aaron, but I'll just jump right in there. Um, every English major used to have to memorize that. I'm not sure that still happens. No, Audra's saying no, it doesn't. <laughs> it should. Um, Put my little phone here to make sure I don't go on too long. I thought today um, I would read just some new poems that are sort of moving around the edges of things, things I don't quite know where they're going to go. Someone asked me what I was going to read, and I said, oh, you know, I think I'm going to read some new things that I haven't read very much or at all in public. Um, and, uh, you know, I'm not even sure if they're any good. And they said, well, aren't you worried about that? And I said, no, this is a, you know, U of M Ann Arbor audience. They'll forgive a bad poem or two. Uh, and then this person said, no, they won't. That's your hardest audience. So uh, I don't know. Maybe I will not be forgiven for these poems. We'll find out. Uh, I did that little book that Aaron mentioned, and it was a, it was a book that um, was in a fairly uh, unforgiving, tight little form that, that I invented. Um, and I got done with it, and I said, well, I'm not going to do any more in this form. And then I was asked to do a poem for an anthology of Upper Peninsula writing. And I really wanted to be in this anthology of Upper Peninsula writing because I love the UP. I love the UP. Um, and uh, so I had one more of these things that was sort of on the workbench that wasn't done, and I sort of beat it into shape. Uh, it takes place on Drummond Island. Drummond Island is over here. It's at the eastern end of the Upper Peninsula. Um, there's a fabulous geologic feature on that island called the Alvar. Uh, it's a Scandinavian word for a vast flat, unbroken um, piece of limestone. 12,000 acres, I think, is the one on, on Drummond Island. It's the largest one in the United States. Um, it's the largest one in North America. Stuff that grows on it is very weird and different. When it falls off and breaks off on the northern coast of Drummond Island, which is very hard to get to, and but it's worth going to, there's this incredible display of fossils, and you sit there and bathe yourself in a ancient forest. It's great. Drummond Island Fossils. Take the ferry east out of Detour, then drive up across the Alvar Plains to a path that leads you to the shore. There, rock ledges step down to the lake. Kneel, look closely. You'll see shadows then, limestone honeycombed with delicate coral branches that waved from the floor of an ocean we can't imagine. Um, like, I think many writers, not just poets, the stuff you're doing at a particular time, you'll, you'll see certain turns of phrase and certain attitudes that uh, reappear. Um, that's just kind of the way we work. Um, as a species, I mean, not necessarily as a 
representatives of particular art. Uh, this is a little longer. Um, it was, it was all, it's also in a fairly rigid form, which I won't bother explaining to you. But uh, there's a lovely site, um, or a, 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 a web, an e-list um, called birders at umich.edu um, that I, I bet you I'm the only person in this room who is on that list serve. Somebody else is? Did somebody say yes? You are, Wendy? All right, good job. Um, the, uh, uh, and we get notifications about odd, strange birds that are visiting some, anywhere close. Um, when when bird, bird watchers go looking for one particular bird, when there's one bird of a species here that's not supposed to be here, we, we use the phrase chasing the bird. So this is uh, chasing a bird that really was a long ways from here. It's a bird that, that spends most of its life in the middle of the Pacific Ocean. It shouldn't have been here. Chasing the ancient murelet. Ancient because of a gray mantle thrown over its shoulders, which look hunched against the weather of the North Pacific, its real home too far from this place at the edge of Lake Michigan to be imagined, where the untouched but beautiful young run down the beach in summertime, longing to leave their parents who make steel appliances and claim to love the wind and winter. The bird is lost or brave or blown here by westerlies strong enough to reshape its instincts, to bring it down to the dirty mouth of a river that drains the abandoned car factories of South Bend, and the ancient murelet bobs in these choppy, irregular freshwater swells, diving often after crustaceans that haven't lived here for a geologic epoch, but taking what minnows it can find to keep off hunger until it dies here in a place it doesn't belong, where it can't find the right food or mate, but where I find it, following clear directions on the internet to catch a quick glimpse as it rises between waves of its two-toned bill and the large head, bulky, oversized, on its small, diminished body. Uh, three, about two and a half years ago, we had the first, what we thought were the first records of um, wolves returning to, on, on their own, returning to the Lower Peninsula to den and breed, and this was, this was happening on the property the university owns uh, at the university's biological station up just south of the bridge. The university's had 10,000 acres up there for the last 100 years, and they've been studying the regrowth of the forest. It's a fascinating place. I get to spend my summers there. Um, so the, the wolves were the talk, of the talk of the camp that summer, um, and I wrote this poem, in the presence of large predators. We're sure now, wolves have found their way back here to the Lower Peninsula, first reported by a park ranger looking north across the straits through snow, uncertainly watching a gray pair skitter across the ice, their tracks lost in the storm, then only a few prints for years, some scat found 20 miles south before a night vision camera catches movement and the lanky legs, massive chest and triangular head, those green eyes glowing once again here enter the frame. And even though we've learned our lessons and fear, there are many reasons not to celebrate anything without reservation. We listen expectantly with hope for the quiet yip of pups hiding close to an overgrown two-track road or looking off across the lake, peering through fog at the far shore to a woods suddenly transformed into forest, alive again under fragile light. Then the next summer, they did, they were able to, to capture a couple of the pups temporarily and do blood studies. So I have to write a part two to this poem, which will be called Addendum After the DNA. And the poem is not written yet, but the first line is going to be, okay, so they're coyotes. <laughs> Here's one about the same time. All I'm trying to do. Still enough of a farm boy to stop when I see a calf bawling outside a barbed wire fence, its mother sad-eyed, resign, resigned, snuggling up to the tines, ruminating. I try to lift it over the fence, fence, away from coyotes or the wolves return to our forests now, who have surely heard this newborn squealing, but it kicks out at my head, though all I'm trying to do is help. One other critter, this one closer to, closer to home, 
just on the west side of Ann Arbor. Uh, there's a human being in it too, but uh, also a little bird. You can do, you can actually do the thing that is described in this in this poem, by the way, and it's really cool when you do it. This is called the Weaver. Now that her eyes are failing, the Weaver visits an abandoned gravel pit in early May, just when bank swallows have returned to dig their burrows into the loose cliffs. She takes an old pillow, fraying, about to split filled with the white down of domesticated geese. She stands at the lip of the pit, rips into the pillow, and releases handfuls of white feathers into the drafts, blowing up against her. The swallows swirl in, pluck feathers from the air, swoop close to pick the small ones that catch in the weaver's hair. As I was getting, changing out of those, those poems, um, our friend Ben Payloff, who will also be reading on Monday, sorry I won't be in town, be great reading, um, asked me to write an essay on Jean Foulin for the Boston Review. Um, and I started reading all this stuff and it just sort of carried me away and I'd, I'd read it before but it was like I was getting overwhelmed again. Never did write the essay for Ben, I feel bad about that. Um, I've apologized profusely several times. But I have a bunch of these little poems that are sort of colored I think by the reading of, of Foulin where um, a sort of easiness with um, certain kinds of abstraction, um, a sort of fascination with history, and a sort of fascination with the mysterious turns that small historical moments will take. Um, and, and heavily weighted with illusion, um, too, which is an interesting thing that you don't really think about in those little, tiny little wonderful poems. Uh, so here's a poem connected to those other ones, and uh, sort of moving in that other direction, but it's a poem about the, a poem that that comes out of the teaching I do in the summertime when I teach young scientists. Um, I love teaching young scientists, they're great. Um, there is one th thing that, that scientists, both young and old, are not cursed with like most of us are, um, and that's um, debilitating uncertainty. They don't have that. Um, uh, you know, if, if they're uncertain, they test it. If we're uncertain, we drink or take drugs or something, you know. So, um, and uh, it's, it's, why, it's why poets die young. Um, so this is a poem that's kind of round about that. It's called Summer Teaching. As I drove the young scientists back from a beaver dam, I listened to their talk about life as information encoded in letters between spiraling strands of protein, how we would soon digitize our sequences and the information that is us, everything about us would never die. I drove carefully on the back roads and the freeway, hoping that whatever gods left that day hadn't heard or were off chasing beautiful children who escaped by turning into trees. I uh, ended up also doing a bunch of these tiny little poems um, about travel, some of them remembering my own travel, but a lot of them living vicariously through my daughter, my 20-year-old daughter, who now is the one who gets to travel to interesting places because I'm too old. This is one where the, the title becomes the first line. When the girls arrived in Copenhagen and left the station near midnight, snow fell in soft piles on their hats and backpacks. No cars or people passed while they walked down the hushed streets. Through windows without blinds or curtains, they could see Danes bathed in blue television light or quietly reading in uncluttered rooms small novels, perhaps about two girls long ago walking through snow. After she was sick on the way to Calcutta, she sat by an open door sucking in the thick monsoon air. Outside the train, the night was a moist black wall broken only occasionally by light from a village fire. A return. When she bent over the twins who were sleeping on the floor, I thought that the sadness and wisdom of her trip still clung to her and hoped for the time that would arrive soon enough when she could be silly again, lovably ordinary, and I could look at her unafraid. Here's one from my own travels. I dug this one out today because uh, 
the 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 merchant that it describes in Toulouse in the south of France, and this is 40 years ago now, um, were part of that um, Jewish community in Toulouse, a fairly large Jewish community for Western Europe, um, surviving Jewish community for Western Europe, and uh, um, and they I, I often ran these flower merchants. Um, there's a funny story about why I was applying for a job there, but I'll tell you afterward if you're interested. But I thought I should read this because it recognizes that community. At the flower merchants in Toulouse. Basques and Spaniards, French peasants, not a generation removed from dirt stores, dirt floors, and speaking the old language of the South, yell at each other in the warehouse beside the railroad tracks where the flower wholesaler won't give me work among all the red and yellow blossoms brought north through the night that must get cut, then wrapped before they wilt, and where scents rise in a mix strong enough to turn the whole place quiet. Jump a few because I want to make sure I read a couple that have not I have not read before. So here's I'll read three more. These are all very new. Um, even though I make a good deal of my living um, teaching the literature of the Upper Great Lakes, and and what small reputation I have is often um, described as being a nature writer from the Midwest. Um, I am not an American citizen, um, even though I've lived here for a very long time. We can go into that too, but but every now and then it comes up. There's lots of literary awards I can't even apply for. Um, there's lots of them. If I would get, I couldn't get because whenever it says American writer, that just excludes me. I'm out. Um, and once every ten years, I have to get my green card renewed, um, and it, that is a always a vivid reminder that I don't belong here. Um, immigration application support center. Some words, green card arise from the chaos of Croatian or Chinese, from the wail of Russian babies, and resident alien from the Iraqi cab driver tutored by the Korean mother of three who helps him carve the strange shapes of this foreign alphabet onto his impenetrable forms, writing the tiny language we, the stateless, share in this room without decoration or irony. None of us feels we belong. in the hard months. Oh, I wish I could believe in February that the blood root will really bloom for its short moment until its petals will be knocked off by a cold rain in March, or that the cone flowers will turn to seed in September, September so the finches can pick them apart in one last frenzy of summer, or that the poem will come again, confident and supple in its moment on the page. A little poem to end on. Some of you, I'm sure, um, I wonder if it's everybody, but no, I won't poll. I would hate to embarrass someone. Um, but but in, in the Harry Potter books, um, in, in the one Harry Potter and in the movies, um, they go to, uh, there's a, the, the, the Weasleys have a tent that they set up when they go to some wizarding convention, and it's like a little pup tent, but you walk in and it just keeps getting bigger and opening up into all these sort of magical spaces as, when, on, from the inside, but from the outside it's a little pup tent. I live in a tiny little house that feels exactly that way to me, and has felt that way for decades. It's like, wow, this house is incredible. So this is a poem about my house, Picasso and the Taj Mahal. My house is a labyrinth of unexplored corridors leading off to Taj Mahals that rise out of the mist at dawn. My house contains mountains and rivers and crimson sunbirds using their forked tongues to collect pollen from flowers that don't grow anywhere close to here. There's a place in the basement of my house where all the lines of time intersect and where I stand for whole moments alone on a street in Paris before a small gallery, 1971, and Picasso is still alive. Thank you. <laughs>